Amen and amen. It's good to see you this morning. Well, I'm glad two of you like me. So. <laughs> We're in a series of messages that we've called uh, Breaking Free. And I hope you've been here, for most of it at least. Each one of these messages is built upon the other. And there are about ten in total. So uh, what you didn't get, you can always go back and get a CD or DVD, whatever lights your fire in that regard, and review it. Because some of these things are very important principles that we need to understand, and we need to know if we're going to walk free. Freedom is a big word in the spiritual world, in the Christian world, but not a lot of people are living in freedom in their spiritual life. Too many people are bound by habits, addictions, uh, issues in their life, and uh, some want to be free, some don't care, and on and on that list goes. But the idea is that what God wants for your life is freedom. God wants you to be free. God doesn't want you to be bound up. God wants you to walk in the liberty that Jesus paid for. Now, last Sunday, we titled the message, Who Do You Think You Are? And uh, that's important for you to settle because you'll live by whatever your perceived uh, idea of yourself is. You're going to live out of that. If you see yourself as... Uh, just someone out there who, you know, doesn't mean much and hadn't done much or doesn't think you have much, then that's kind of the way you'll live. If you see yourself like a pauper in, in, in spiritual life, you'll live as a spiritual pauper. But if you read the Bible and discover what the Bible says about you, which is what we dealt with last week, and see yourself in that perspective, it'll change the very way that you behave. Last week we talked about the fact that if you are a believer, something happened not within this natural realm so much as it did in the supernatural realm, the spiritual realm, which is a very real world. In fact, I, I think it's more real than the so-called physical world because everything around you that you see in the physical world is going to deteriorate, rut, rot, rot, and die. Amen? That's the physical world we live in. You, you just bought that new car, well, it won't be worth much in about five years. Okay? So that's, <laughs> that's the reality of that. But what is real, real, reality real is that which is eternal that which goes on forever and you are an eternal being and when you come to Christ something supernaturally happens in you Ephesians 2 says you are made alive King James Version says you are quickened and I like that word because I mean just the idea of, of a quickening of a supernatural cosmic event taking place in you that literally transforms your life from the inside out takes place Jesus said you're born again. I think sometimes in the religious world we kind of downplay that word or, or don't even understand the significance of what that really means. I mean, it literally means that there is a new life that has taken place within this old life. I, I am not what I used to be when I give my life to Christ. I mean, it is supernatural. I, I remember my brother coming over witnessing to me a lot. You need to get saved. You need to get saved. You need to give your life to Jesus and all that stuff, you know. And I'd look at Christians and him and others and say, well, I can't live like that. And I could. I, mean, I, I faked it for years at different places and times of my life. I can't live like that. The idea is that when you are born again, when you are quickened, when the Holy Spirit comes to live in your being and you are spiritually birthed and made alive in that moment, you can do about anything God tells you to do. In fact, you can do anything God tells you to do. And you are made alive and you are given in that new life a unique capacity. So last week we dealt with our identity. Who are we? And it's important you understand who you are because if you lived in the perceived identity of your old life, you'll never be anything in your Christian walk in life. You'll be a miserable failure. You'll end up trying to do everything for God by the energy of your own strength or the energy of your flesh and you will just fail miserably, all right? But when you understand that you are this new person and you start realizing what that means and what this new person has and who you are now, not what you pretend to be, not what you'd like to be, but what God has really done in you, when you get a hold of that, that transforms your life. And you'll start experiencing the new life. Doesn't mean you're made absolutely sinless or perfect. As I said last week, you're not sinless, but you sin less. Amen. Work that over for a little bit for those of you who ate too much donuts for breakfast. But as we look today, we're looking at Breaking Free Part 4. Uh, I remember just dealing with different people who were in spiritual conflicts and fighting spiritual influences within their life. And I'd just say, simply say to them, here's what you need to do. Next time you deal with that and you know it's just the enemy, why don't you just say out loud, because the devil can't read your mind. Why don't you just say out loud, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. 
and people say something like this. Uh, I haven't been saved long enough. Or I, I, I'm not mature as a Christian yet. When I, when I get mature, then I can rebuke the devil. It doesn't have anything to do with maturity. How long you've known Christ. It has everything to do with who you are now in Christ that you've given your life to him. It has everything to do with your position in Christ. So it doesn't matter if you're a pastor or evangelist, a deacon, an elder in the church, or Grandma Grump over there, or six-year-old little girl who just gave her life to Jesus, you all have the same authority in Christ. We all live on equal ground around the cross of Jesus Christ. You have what you need to fight the spiritual fight. The Bible puts it very simply in the book of James. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. In other words, that word means you have to do something. You, you're involved. Resisting the devil in your life is your responsibility based upon the authority that you now possess in Christ Jesus. You've been given the authority, the right, the power to do that. But you have to do it. Most people don't resist the devil. They assist the devil. They kind of go along with whatever he says and go along, well, you know, it's just my nature, Pastor. It's just, just the way I am. You know, it's just, I, just, I just can't, that's the way I was raised. And, and on and on it goes. That's my personality. Well, that's who you were before you gave your life to Christ. That's what you did. But when you come to Christ, you don't have to do what you used to do because you're new. You're a new person. So we dealt with that. Who is that new person? Today I want to deal with what does that new person possess? What does that new person have? What's, what's at your disposal for, for living the Christian life so that you can resist the enemy and you can do it with authority and you can do it with a confidence. You know, he, he hears you. Amen? The devil hears what you're saying to him. So what I want to make to you a simple point first and foremost this morning is we have what we need when we gave our life to Jesus. Let's go back and look at the disciples when they were called in Luke chapter 9. It says he called the 12 together and catch this. He gave them power and authority. Two different words. He gave them power and he gave them authority over demons and to heal diseases. And he set them out to, to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healings. Now we know that the healing issue and all that, that, that uh, that's unique to this apostolic age. And there were just instant healings, instant time. But we know God still heals today. But I don't think that that ministry uniquely of healing has been given to Every Christian is a spiritual gift, all right? There are those who like to purport so, but I wish they'd just head down to the hospital and show us how it's done. Can I get a witness? Amen. So Jesus calls these 12 to himself, and knowing that they're going to face what he had to face, it says he gives them what they need to face it. I mean, I don't know about you, but can you imagine being one of those 12 when Jesus says, all right, boys, it's time to do this on your own. I want you to go out and... Uh, come back and report how things went for you. He said, and remember, they've just seen these demons manifest and these demons speaking and, you know, all this stuff was going on and they, they're, they're screaming out, Jesus, what are we to do with it? And all the people are quivering and throwing themselves into the fires and, you know, all, they've seen all this. And, you know, can you imagine what's going through their mind? Oh, uh, we're supposed to do what you do? Yes, I've given you what you need. You go out and it says, and then they returned in verse 17 and with joy saying, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now they're all excited about it. It's been pretty much a change because they witnessed and demonstrated the authority that believers have in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, the Lord does that here. Later on, he sends 70 out with the same mission, you know, to go out and have authority over these demonic hosts that were plaguing so many people and plaguing and destroying their lives. They come back the next time and Jesus says, I've given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing can injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice in this, that your names are recorded in heaven. And the, the, the lesson there was simply, as you learn about your authority, as you learn what you possess as a Christian, you realize that the devil has to do what you tell him to do in regard to the will of God for your life and family that he has to respond to you, don't be excited about that. It is not the knowledge of error, it's the knowledge of truth. So even though you understand how Satan works and what he has to respond to and what his authority is and the, and the limits of Satan's authority, as you discover that, don't come back and say, I think I need to start a deliverance ministry. He said, be excited about the kingdom. Be excited about the message and the gospel, the gospel message of the kingdom. Let's stay Jesus-focused. 
You'll have to deal with these things in your life, but the focus is always Christ and God the Father. He would be glorified in our lives. They're, they're, they're going out, they're realizing that demons have to be reckoned with, and they are reckoning with him. And the truth is what they're living out. The truth of knowing that what God has given them is being lived out. So here's what he says to him. He says, I give to you the power and the authority, or the authority and the power to do this. Now, so what he's done here, he's, he's given his disciples right to do it and the ability to do it. Giving you, and it's important because if, if one thing to say, you have the right to do this, but don't give them the ability to do it, then, then they fall flat on their faces. Uh, I mean, just, it, even in the business world we live in, if we hire somebody, we give them a job to do, we're going to give them the, the, the tools to do the job. And so he gives them two things here, and they're very unique. One, he says, I'm giving you authority. Now, authority basically means that all through the New Testament is the right to rule. In other words, you have a, de a delegated privilege in this point. You have a delegated thing that you can do now. We take people in our culture and our society and we train them as police officers and they get through the academy, they pass all the tests, we put a badge and a gun up on them and we've now given them authority to carry out the law as, this, as, as, as their responsibility is given out to them. What makes them different from you? The badge. <laughs> All right? You respect the badge. You respect the delegated authority of the people that gave them the right to do that. So they have this authority. It's their right to do it. They can step out into an intersection out here, the busiest of intersections they choose, get in the middle of that intersection and tell people to stop and to start whenever they so desire. I think I'll let this group go. You stop, you come through. No, I think you'll stop. And you, no, you can turn that way. You know, whatever they're, you do, what they're being, they have that badge. They have that right that they have been given. And the, the, the scriptures tell us as believers, we've been given simply a badge to carry that gives us the authority to rule over the enemy that's attacking our lives. Matthew 28, Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me. So who has all authority? Jesus. Is his authority bigger than the devil's? Incredibly so. We'll look at that in a moment. All authority is over the enemy. Now he says, I'm giving that to you. The same thing he did here in, in Luke chapter 7 and 9 and 10 as they go out and, and, and respond to the Lord. And then, but he not only gives them authority, he also gives them power. Now power is the ability to rule. Now, the officer of the law may have the authority to step out there because he's got the badge and the training and to stop the traffic, but... He doesn't have the physical ability to stop that traffic. Just let one car hit him right upside the head and he's done with. Now, he may go get a, uh, a tractor and pull one of these 20-ton cement blocks in the middle of the intersection. All right, that has the power to stop you. Doesn't have the right to stop you. So I want you to see the difference between there, there, there's a right to rule and then there's the ability to rule. And as far as your spiritual life is concerned and spiritual warfare and spiritual battles are concerned, you have both. You have the right and you have the might. You have what you need. You have everything that you need. And if, if you don't have that, then you're missing the mark. The problem is your perception so often. Your problem is you believe a lie. The problem is you don't understand maybe the spiritual truth. It's like David when he comes to the front lines, and you remember the story of Goliath, right? And, and all the armies of Israel, and I think for seven, eight days, they've been coming up, the Bible says, in battle array. And every day when they get up there, I mean, they've been preparing for war, and sharpening their swords and putting their armor on, cheering the, cheering the battle cheers, you know, we're going to kill them, we're going to rock them, we're going to destroy the world, we will, we will rock you. They get all up there and they're ready to go to battle. And there's Goliath in the valley by himself. Seven days they've done this. And nobody's gone down to fight Goliath. Till this boy shows up who had a different perspective of things, who spent time with God, who knew God and knew what God was like. And what does he come up and do? He looks out there and says, who is that uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? And he goes down and takes him out in the battle. Why did he do that and the others didn't? Again, it got back to, he knew who he was and he knew who God was. He knew he was a servant. He had what he needed for the issue that stood in front of him. 
And, you know, he'd even experienced his life. He'd started out killing lions and bears and other stuff, you know. I think I'd rather face a Goliath than a bear, personally. I don't know about you, for, the, for those other hunters in the crowd. But anyway, the issue is here. He knew who God was. And he knew what God was capable of. And he knew what he was capable of because of God and what God had done for him. Listen, you, you don't have to read much of Psalms to discover his relationship to the Lord and his understanding of God and God's ways. So the bottom line gets to this. You plus Jesus... You having the right understanding of who you are, who he is, what you've been given. Hey, Jesus plus you is unfair. You say, well, you don't have to deal with. Jesus plus you is a fixed fight. But you don't understand how big this problem is. Jesus plus you is victory. No matter what your problem, what your mountain, what your issue might be. But if you don't get that straight, then you're going to live in bondage the rest of your life. So you have the authority. And you have the might. The issue gets down to this. You have to use it. You know, it's a matter of pulling rank. It's a matter of showing your badge. It's a matter of stepping out and saying, you know, hey, the demons are subject to the name of Jesus as I invoke that name. They're subject to me. And Scripture teaches us all through the Word of God. In Luke 10, 17, they came back and said, the demons are subject to us in your name. Subject is the word hupotasso, which means to basically to get in order. It, it's a term which is first of all used as, as a military term of making sure that everybody's in the right place. You know, the generals where he is, the sergeants, commanders, the chiefs, the colonels. Everybody understands the order and everybody responds to the order. Last week I talked about the spiritual battle we face. And I, even the week before that I mentioned the illustration. Most people feel like they're in a spiritual tug of war. They got God on one side, and they know I'm wrong. I know I'm not doing right. I know I've messed up. I know I shouldn't have done it. And, and they feel like, here's God on one side, and he's pulling the rope. The devil's on the other side, and he's pulling the rope. And you're just kind of caught in the middle. No, God doesn't pull the rope. Amen. The battle has already been won by Jesus at the cross and the resurrection. All right? You're the one pulling on the rope. Right. And you need to let go of the rope and get a hold of God. And quit battling on this, on this horizontal plane. Jesus said the spirits are subject. That deals with a vertical plane. All right? Top to bottom. We don't wrestle out this way. I have authority that God gave me. It comes down to me. And I act on the authority that God's given me. Our, our, our civilized social structure has that same order to it. There, there, there's leadership on your job. There's a boss, all right? There's employees. There's people over departments. There's division heads. In, in the military, it's the same. In your home, there's order. There's, there's, there's a government that God has placed in. God says, listen, all authority comes from me. The whole concept of authority comes from him. So if I have a problem, I need to deal not on the outside, some kind of spiritual tug of war. I need to go first of all to God, who's my authority, and see what he wants me to do, and then I respond accordingly. You say, well, you don't know what these outside forces are doing. No, you don't understand how big God is. And you can act accordingly to what God says. You have the might. You have the right. Yes, the kingdom of Satan is powerful. The kingdom of this world is powerful because he manipulates that. The flesh he manipulates. You're not stuck in the middle in some kind of tug of war between all those things. You're, you're, you're a person who must respond to this vertical chain of command. And at the very top of it sits Jesus, who he says in Matthew 28, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. So who's in charge? Jesus. Who's in charge? Jesus. Who's in charge? Jesus. And you, if you'll submit to Christ. Now, if you're living outside the will of God and you're rebelling against God and you're doing what you want to do, you know, you ain't got enough spiritual power to blow your spiritual nose, all right? You can, you can talk about it a lot, but it's just hot air. But when you surrender your heart to God, you surrender your life to Christ, and it becomes reality now, and you're serious about your life with Jesus, guess what happens? You've now been, you, you're now the per, kind of person who can walk in that authority. So, Brother Joe, you, you have to realize that the kingdom of darkness in this world, these are real strong influences. It's just, you know, it's, it's, a, real, it's a real world, you know. And it's such power. Listen, the only power of the devil, the only power of the forces of hell, the only powers of the kingdom of darkness are found in one word. It's called a lie. Right. He says, it won't work. You can't. You're not up to it. Who do you think you are? 
He's always imposing, intimidating, condemning, whatever he can do. But it's always contrary to the truth. So what do I do? I have to find out what the truth is. We dealt with that last week. I'm in the Word. I'm letting the Word in me. I'm abiding in the Word. Jesus is making a difference in my life. So now I know the truth. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. There you have it. See, you are making it so difficult. When in reality, it is simple. Will I follow Christ? Will I submit my, to my will to His will? Will I let Him be at the top? Will I fall in line underneath? And as I do that, well, you know, who's that, who else is in line? Well, there's God the Father, and there's me, and the Bible says there's angels there. It said, but you know, you and I as redeemed children of God, we're even above the angels. All right? And guess who's at the bottom? Who's at the bottom? The devil. Where's he at in this power? At the bottom. Listen to what 1 John says. I love this verse, and it troubled me for some time because my reality said something different. First John, John writes to the church, and he says, We are of God, little children. He says that over and over through that letter, doesn't he? We are of God, little children. And he says, Hereby we know we're the children of God because the wicked one cannot touch us. Amen. Now, again, does that cause you to struggle with the reality a little bit? I know what the Bible says, but here's my reality. Maybe I just need to deliver that news to the things that are touching me to the things that are bothering me, to the things that are harassing me. And maybe I need to, to, to tell that the devil, say, well, devil, uh, maybe you haven't read all the Bible. Are you waiting for me to impose it? But it says here, you can't touch me. Now, obviously, if my heart's not right, and I'm backslidden, I'm not doing God's will, or I'm not a Christian, then Satan's got all the room he wants to continue to wreak havoc in my spiritual life. Because I'm not resisting him. He's, and what happens if you don't resist the enemy? Well, just read the news of what's happening in Iraq. <laughs> Find out real quick what happens when you don't resist the enemy. He comes in like a flood. And the only way he's going to do anything and respond to anything is when you tell him what the Word of God has to say. So too often we're trying to look at our levels of spiritual maturity, our knowledge of the Bible and stuff, and we just need to act on what God's told us. I remember I had a, a meeting with a... With a, with a guy, and I'd been counseling. This guy was obviously not wanting to get right with God. And he was just full of the devil. I mean, there would be these manifestations of anger and garbage and, you know, stuff would just come out of him. It was obviously wasn't, wasn't him and it wasn't God. We knew what the source was. In fact, we just sat down in this living room, had a guy with me. And uh, as we sat down and started talking, man, all, there was this, you know, all this garbage started coming up. And, you know, it was ultimately just a, a demonic manifestation taking place here. It's, you know, voices change and everything. And he reaches over and he grabs a, uh, a bottle there. Sitting, he's sitting by the fireplace. I'm on the couch across. I mean, and he cracks that bottle on the fireplace and starts to get up and come toward me and start making all these threats. I said, listen, we'll use the word Mike. I said, Mike, you need to sit down right now in the name of Jesus Christ and be quiet. Well, he backs up, sets down the chair, and puts down the deal. Now, I don't think it's because I'm, I'm so imposing. <laughs> My manly physique scared him off. No. I dealt with the issues that was dealing with him. And we've seen that over and over and over again. You know, and, and those who've been in ministry for a length of time have seen that over and over again. We were at one of our, 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 our meetings in, in out, out in Magnolia area one time. We, we had a coffee house ministry out there. And I'd sent some people to be counseled with it to come forward in the decision time to be counseled. One of the counselors came running back in after it was over. He said, I got this guy in the office back there. He's going crazy, man. He's just, it's just the devil, man. This guy's going nuts. He's, you know, he tossed me across the room and, you know, I said, you need to come deal with him. I said, well, where is he? He said, well, he's, in that, he's in that room. And so I went back there and I knew who the guy was. I was the one who invited him there. My favorite kind of people. Amen. I mean, you're supposed to have folks in bondage. <laughs> so I get in there, and uh, I just simply told him, I said, I said, you need to set up, and you need to sit down right now in the name of Jesus. And I probably should have said, sit down in a chair, because he just fell on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Where does that come? That's not anybody's power. That's just the authority of Christ. Yes. I think Terry Acker shared it not too long ago in one of the deals we were in, uh, that uh, first time we went to Belize, 
You know, we, we were setting up in the park there. We had, there's three of us. We had a, you know, three-man band, and we were going to sing and preach and, and testify. And while we're setting up, there's this Rastafarian guy, and they were a lot more belligerent and, and uh, aggressive towards Christians back in those days than they are today as much. But, you know, he, he came in there and stood beside us and started talking to Terry. What are you guys doing here? What do you think you're doing here? It's not your country. You don't have a right to be here. And uh, he said... Uh, I'm standing by. He said, my, my God's bigger than that white God you serve. I, I, that was enough. I finally went over and said, listen, number one, my God's not white. My God's God. He's not a man. Number two, his son, who is God, is Jewish, and he's probably Sephardic, a dark Jew, you know, Sephardic kind of Jewish. And so he's not white either. So you got the wrong guys. Oh, my God, my gods are bigger than yours. I said, let me just prove it to you today that your gods are not bigger. How are you going to do that? I said, we're going to be here about two hours singing and preaching and sharing Jesus. And you're going to stay for all of it. In fact, you're going, to stay, you're going to stand right here and stay for all of it. In the name of Jesus, you're not even going to move or say anything. And sure enough, for two hours, he stood there the whole time. He didn't move. He didn't go anywhere. In fact, we were packing up our equipment. Terry came and says, what do you want to do with him? <laughs> What do we do? I said, well, you tell him whose God is bigger and let him go. He left quickly after that. You know, you do that when the Holy Spirit impresses you to do that, which he did in that moment to impress me to do that. But at the same time, you also understand that situation or any other situation where Satan's imposing his will over God's will, you have a right to speak to him. You have a right to speak to him. And we talked about Peter and how the devil spoke through Peter last week. I, I don't know what all the crunching is, but uh, the devil spoke through Peter last week. And, you know, and Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. You savor not the things of God. In a word, the only weapon that the enemy has in your life or against your life is a lie. You say, well, Joe, you're talking about the disciples. And that was, you know, that was a long time ago. But what about us today? And what about, what about a contemporary world that we live in? How much authority do we carry? All right. Well, Jesus' power hadn't changed. You say, well, the disciples were with Jesus. But hey, the difference is we are in Christ. And because of the resurrected power of Jesus, because of the ascension of Jesus Christ, followed by the Holy Spirit visiting the church, and now men being indwelt by the Holy Spirit in the context of the church, the New Testament church, you, I believe, have a greater advantage in spiritual warfare than even the disciples had. You're indwelt by God. Christ lives in you. And now you can move and operate in his authority as he lives in you. Well, you, I believe that the, Paul wrote to Ephesians just to, to confirm that. Let me share with you a few verses out of the first chapter of Ephesians. Must it be the God of, of, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Now catch this. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ? just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. It was in the mind of God for you to come to Christ before the world was even formed, that lost men would come and be saved through Christ. And now that when we do come, we've been separated from God by our sin, now that we're made alive in Christ and brought back to God, made one with him through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, we come through him, guess what happens? Says, now God, because of that, has blessed you. How much has God blessed me? Read it with every. Spiritual blessing. In other words, you have everything in Christ you need to be a victor, not a victim, in your walk and in your life. He goes on to say, just a couple verses down, to the praise of the glory of His grace. What did He do with that? He freely bestowed on us in the beloved. We have redemption through His blood. I mean, what more could you want? You've been saved from the powers and the forces of hell. You have the spiritual blessings. And now you've been bestowed with this abundant, amazing, supernatural grace of God. A couple of verses down. He made known to us the mystery of his will. According to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is in summing up of all things in Christ. Now, what is all that administration, the summation of all things in all time? In other words, there's coming a day. When everything is going to realize that Jesus is Lord. When he will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. When all things will be brought into submission to him. That every rebellious thing will be dealt with. Everything out of the will of God will be dealt with. Everything will be issued, you know, a simple proclamation and they will know it clear. Bow at the name of Jesus. And they will do so. The fullness of all things will come. 
a new heaven, a new earth, and we'll see the glory and the grace and the power of God that he's always had. Verse 10 says, but in Jesus, we also, we've obtained an inheritance to, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glories. In him, you also, after you heard the message of the truth, in other words, after you got saved, the gospel of your salvation, you believed it. He said, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. In other words, he says, you've been blessed, you've been graced, you've been given a surpassing authority in Christ Jesus. He's going to carry you to the end because you're now, you've even been sealed. I mean, you're taking care of inward, you're taking care of outward. I mean, what more do you want? You've got everything you need to be what God's called you to be. Again, why would God call us to be something that he wouldn't empower us to be it? Why would God tell me to live a unique kind of life if he didn't give me the strength to do it? It's just setting me up for failure. But he didn't. He set me up for success. Give me the ability to successfully live in any environment. Some of y'all got that. Let's, let's catch it. After he shared all these things with them about everything that they have in Christ, and by the way, if you open up Ephesians 1 and you go home and you look at it, you'll find out that 10 times in the first 13 verses, he reminds us that everything we have from God and who we are is a result of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 10 times he keeps informing you. It's because you believed. It's because you trusted. It's because you received. You're a child of God. Now, if you don't trust Christ, none of this is yours. You, know, you have nothing to look forward to. Hell on earth and hell to come. Period. You say, well, not me, man. I can make it better. How's that working? Seriously, how's that working for you? It not, is it? And it never will. And even if it does somehow, you kind of put the pieces together, it's going to come a day when it will absolutely all fall apart. So he gives this explanation in Ephesians 1 of what we've got. And then he, he says, now, I'm praying. I'm praying that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened and open so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. And you may know what are the riches of the glory of the, this inheritance in the saints. And you will know what's the surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe. This is in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of heavenly places. Basically saying, get your eyes open. My prayer is that God open your eyes so you see all that God's done for you as a result of the power of the resurrection. Simply put, he's saying, God's power raised up a dead man after he'd been dead three days, left in a tomb, and God supernaturally, by this supernatural power, raised him up from the dead. His name is Jesus. Amen? That's the power of God. But he said, that is the same power which God gave you to live for him. The power of the resurrection is the same power that brought about a resurrection in your life and my life. And he said, Paul said, I pray that your eyes be open so you can just see this. It, that, that, you, that you get a glimpse on what it means. In fact, he uses four different words, four different Greek words in verse 19 to describe this power. He says, what is the surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might? Now, basically, he's talking about power, 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 four power different words, and there are four different words in, in, in the Greek language. The first word he uses for power there, what is the surpassing greatness of his power? That's the word dunamis. That's that same word we get for dynamite, you know. This, this is explosive. I mean, you're talking about the power of the devil over here? He said, that's like a firecracker compared to a nuclear bomb. All right, the power of God is like the nuclear bomb. All the devil can make a little pop at best. And that's because you let him, or you think it's there. He said, then he used this word, not only, not only this, this, this uh, dunamis power, he used the word energia, according to the working. That's where we get the word energy from. He said, there's, there's this energy uh, of the Spirit of God, this energy that flows from the resurrection, and it's basically just God himself. All right? And, and it's almost like there's a struggle to talk about how mighty this power is and how powerful the, the power is. He said, according to the, to the working of the strength, the word kratos. He's given you what you need in strength and in power. And he used this word might, iskus. All these have to say, hey, there's this supernatural grace. There's this supernatural power that raised up Christ from the dead. It defeated Satan at the cross. It's available to you to defeat the work of Satan in your life. You just need to see the scope of it and just how big it is. Behind the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that Authority that raised him up is the same authority that's above all rule and all authority and all dominion, according to, according to Ephesians chapter 1. In fact, that's where he goes on after two verses later. He says, it's far above all rule. It's far above all authority. It's far above all power. 
It's far above all dominions. It's far above every name that's named. In this age and the one to come. In other words, there's nothing greater than this. There's no, there's no power. There's no dominion. There's no kingdom. It may be a great kingdom, but it's not bigger than he is. It may be a great authority, but it's, you know. I, I mean, he said even personalities. Think the most powerful, influential people that history's known. It's still dropping the bucket. I mean, think of the most feared terrorist uh, of the day that are the most powerful, influential politicians or military leaders in the world, people of great power, good or bad. It says he is far above all those things. I mean, in Mexico, those great, great fears is, is possessed or those people who are, are drug barons and the crime kingpins of the world, notorious figures of the past, those who blighted society for years in our, and decades in history, they still don't have the power of God. Nowhere to compare with. It's far above all those things. Nothing to compare. I mean, think about Satan and all the powers of darkness that are held under his command and all those demons. The Bible tells us that Jesus' authority is far above all those things, human and spiritual. Authorities past, authorities present, authorities future. He is far, far, far above them all. What's it saying? There's just no comparison. Simply put, there's no comparison. You just can't do it. But here's what I want you to catch this morning, is that that authority is conferred upon us as believers. God is rich in mercy. And because of his great love with which he loved us, this is after he's talked about in chapter 1, all right, we're going to chapter 2. Because he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He said, because you're a believer, you're now in Christ and you're above all these things. Somebody ought to praise the Lord for that. Far above all authority, far above all rule. Why? Because we are together in Christ Jesus. When that take place? The moment you gave your life to Christ, you received the same authority because Christ, it's in Him. You take possession of what God did 2,000 years ago at the resurrection, A.D. 29, whenever it was. That moment in time in history when Christ was died and buried and raised for our sins, it goes all the way back to there. I have this authority that's been conferred upon me and so do you. You say, well, you know, I haven't been saved. It doesn't matter. It's not a matter of maturity. It's a matter of position. You're in Christ, so you have what you need. You're spiritually alive right now in Christ. You're seated in heavenly places right now in Christ. You possess the authority you need to, take, to live the kind of life God wants you to live right now. You possess authority over the kingdom of darkness right now. You possess everything you need. Colossians 2.10 says, in him, you have been made complete. Do you believe that? Yeah. Do you believe that? If you believe that, you know, then receive it. And by the way, if you look back at all these verses we just read, they're all in the past tense. This is what God has already done. This is what God has done. This is what God has done. This is what God has done. He did this. He did this. It's all past in. When, when? At the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And since Christ is the God-appointed head over all rule and authority, and since I possess Jesus Christ, guess what? I have what I need to live the kind of life God's called me to live. Now, it simply gets down to this. A lot of people say, yeah, I believe that, but you're still living with habits. You're still living with ungodly things going on in your heart and life and your mind. You're still living with these, with these, these issues of addictions. You've still got all these other problems. And you live in bondage. You're bound by fears. Some people are bound by hate. Some people are bound by unforgiveness and bitterness. Some people are bound by drugs, prescription or otherwise. What are you going to do? Well, I believe that. Then what do you need to do? Well, let's, let's, let's give me four things right here. We'll wrap it up. I'll put them up. You have what it takes. And I'll put all four up. All right? First step is belief. He said, when you believe it, faith without works is dead. Do I believe it? Then I'm going to start stepping on it. I'm going to start believing it. That means that if, if, if I go home and I realize that I'm in bondage to some garbage in my life, that means that I'm laying it down today. I believe the truth. Well, don't you think I need to go through 12 steps, 10 steps, 7 steps, 42 steps? You can do whatever you want to do, but you're free today. 
you're free today. And I know this is not popular philosophy with the culture. The guy said, well, you know, I'm an alcoholic, but I call it my life. Hell, I was an alcoholic, but I'm not an alcoholic anymore. I was a drug addict, but I'm not a drug addict anymore. All right? In my flesh, I can be anything. That's a mess. I was addicted to being a mess. <laughs> But Jesus set me free. He sets us free. So today, well, I believe the truth. And if I believe the truth, then I will, I will deliver the news to the enemy. I'm no longer in bondage to you. Number two is humility. You know? And humility gets down to really to God dependence. I, it's not me. I'm not saying, well, look what I did for God. Look what I did. No, God did this. I'm not saying, look what I did with God's help. No, I'm not doing that. I'm saying, look what God did. That's humility. Look what God did. We don't take any glory. It's just all the glory to God. That, that's humility. And you walk in humility, you walk in freedom. Boldness. Too many Christians are afraid, are fearful, and sometimes they're not afraid of the devil or the world. It's just they're afraid of failure. Well, what if it don't work? Excuse me, did you not hear everything I just said? Are you trying to tell me that God doesn't work? God works fine. If it's a failure, it's on your end. And you may struggle a couple times before you get this down in your life, but hey, I'd rather be falling in the right direction than not falling at all. And be falling back in the traps. Amen? Maybe a point of failure, but I'll repent and get right with God and press on. I'm not going deeper and deeper and deeper. I'm coming out and out and out and out. But it takes boldness for you to deliver the enemy's message and say, listen, you know, and this, some of you need to literally tell the devil out loud, he can't read your mind, by the way, and say, listen, I've given you far too much authority in my life, far too long. I am sick and tired of you telling me what to do. I'm sick and tired of falling into these traps. I'm sick and tired of being stupid. I'm sick and tired of believing everything you tell me. I'm not living like that anymore. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I am no longer serving you. Amen. Period. Amen. It takes some spiritual courage. You say, well, I don't know if I can do that. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about cowards. It says in the end, when he overcomes and all things are submitted to him, he said, oh, he said but there's going to be that group said that the fearful, the cowardly, the unbelieving, and the abominable, and the murderers, and the immoral persons, the sorcerers, the idolaters, the liars, they'll all have their part in the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. That's the second death. That's the worst death. Now, it says, well, yeah, those immoral people, yeah, and those sorcerers, and idolaters, and liars, man, they're going to go to hell. Good for them. But he says, what about the unbelieving and the cowardly? And sometimes it's just, it's not people's great minds that keep them from God is their cowardly hearts that keep them from God. It's not this great intellect. It's those little hearts that can't stand up and say, I'm going to be what God's called me to be. I believe what the Bible has to say. The last is dependence, and that's a walk, and that's a lifestyle that says, I'm going to walk, and I'm going to depend upon the Lord, and I'm going to trust Him with everything. We're not raiding in, going and raiding the world like we're some kind of evangelical ghostbusters or something. We're just living our lives. So when I get into my home and I sense there's a heaviness and I sense, you know, there's this tension and everybody's fighting each other's house, I can walk into my home and I say, Satan, you have no right here. This does not belong to you. This, is, this, this belongs to God. My house belongs to God. All right? All right? And so you don't have a right to be in here. You get, wherever you're, the Bible calls it the prince of power of the air. He just kind of roams around the atmosphere, you know? You clear the air in the name of Jesus. You don't have a right to be here. You get out. It's, this is not your place. And as a parent, I do the whole time. I pray that way all the time over my children. Say, you don't have a right to, you don't have a right to be there. You don't have a right to be there. You, you, you are dismissed now in the name of Jesus. When temptation comes, that ought to be your first resort. Say, so I can do this. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, well, it's just say to Satan, get out of here. I, I'm, I'm on to you now. Paul said we're not ignorant of his devices. Hey, I, I know how you work. Some of you have been trapped in the same sin for a long time. You ought to know how it works. He comes in with a thought. He plants the thought. You start thinking about the thought. You get preoccupied with the thought. Pretty soon you follow the thought. And who do you think put the thought there? You say, well, what could have been me? It might have been you. But I'm telling you who really behind the scenes is putting it there. He's using your flesh and he's using your thoughts and he disguises his voice and I make it sound just like you. Well, how do I know it's the difference? You don't have to worry about who it is or what the difference is. You just do what God told you to do. You bring those thoughts into captivity. You say, Lord God, here's what I'm thinking about, and I know it's wrong, and you know it's wrong. So in the name of Jesus, Satan, you're out of here, and this thought belongs to you, God, because I'm not pursuing that. I'm pursuing you. Bring every thought in obedience to the captivity of Christ. That's where victory starts coming. The bottom line in all this, folks, is, is freedom. Am I going to be what God's called me to be? Am I going to subject myself to him and experience his authority in my life? Am I going to subject myself to the enemy and experience nothing but victimization in my life? 
and ruin and devastation. Sooner or later, sooner or later, every one of us is going to have to come to the place where, where we, we just choose to believe. And put, get ourselves out of, the, out of the driver's seat and let Christ take charge and humble ourselves before him. And then act like we really believe it. You know, I really do believe it. And it's not an act. It's just stepping out in faith. Just move on. I, I do trust God. God is bigger than this situation. Brother Joe, I've, been, I've had this addiction. I've, I've been, you know, pornography has been bothering me most of my life. I was raised with it. My parents had pornography. And this was, hey, come on, get over it. What are you going to do with those thoughts when they come? Where are they going to go? You're going to rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ and the spirit of immorality. And you're going to look to the Father and say, Lord, where are we going from here? Might be drunkenness, might be, I don't know. It could be unforgiveness. Every time you think of that person, man, the hormones begin to flow. You just get angry. You're going to live in that bondage all your life? You're going to let the name, the mention of someone's name rattle your cage every day? Or are you going to get free? Just forgive them, walk away, surrender the grace of God, and be what God's called you to be. A lot of us don't like to think as Christians that we have anything to do with the devil as far as him being in control of our lives. But all too often, Satan controls far too many Christians' lives than what they're willing to admit. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Fathers, we come to you today and give you this time in our hearts and minds.